You know, there's um, such a beautiful sense of God being glorified in this room. And I just know He's going to minister. He's ministered in the first service. He's going to minister again. And I, I just want us to have open hearts. Whether you've been a Christian for five minutes or 50 years, it doesn't matter. We can always learn a new facet of who God is. So I never get familiar with, well, I've been in church my whole life. I've heard thousands upon thousands and thousands and thousands of messages, but I've never been somebody that will turn off thinking, oh, I've heard this story or know this thing because there's always fresh revelation to be found. But I feel like God's really doing something in the midst of, um, and I just know He's purposed this Word for many, many people, whether you're watching online today or whether you're standing in this room, there's an assignment for you to be in the right place at the right time. And I honestly wanna just ask God to anoint this Word. I can't do anything in my own strength and my words aren't good, but His Word is life-changing. And so Father God, I pray that as we have lifted You up, as we've put You in Your rightful place, You have been glorified. You have been honoured and worshipped. That worship is not just a dress rehearsal. It's not just a warm up, God. It is a posture of our heart that says, God, You are here to be praised. Worship is about You. It's not about us. We honour You this morning. We lift You up, God. And I pray that as we've lifted You up, God, that Your Word says that You draw all men and to Yourself. So God, I pray today that we would have perspective shifts, that we would have hearts that are open, ears to hear, hearts that will yield to Your Word, God. I pray that we would again realise another facet of Your goodness and Your love for us. So God, I pray You speak, because we're listening. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Why don't you take your seats? And uh, I'm just going to get right into it. As um, Pastor Henry said, it's um, Palm Sunday today. And, you know, we're in preparation for the celebration of remembering. I mean, I remember God's death and resurrection, Jesus' death and resurrection every day of my life. I can't live a day without being grateful for His salvation um, in my life. And we should always be grateful. But there's something special about coming around Easter and giving it the rightful celebration that it deserves. And, you know, I was thinking about Palm Sunday and thinking, okay, well, it's the week that Jesus came in, uh, the week, the Passion Week, they call it, of uh, of Him coming into Jerusalem. And really, it's the beginning of the end for Him finally to give His life over. But as I was preparing and I was praying, I think sometimes we we honour, of course, Jesus, and we're going to do that beautifully next week. But As I was praying and thinking about today, I was thinking about the love of the Father that actually gave us His Son. And sometimes we can just focus on Jesus, which we need to, uh, but I want today for us to understand the love of our Father. The love that God, that the Scripture that we quote, the Scripture that is basically on everything, around everything, it's the one that we memorise the most. John 3.16 is more than just a cliche Scripture. It is the essence of who our Father is to us. And today I feel like God's going to recalibrate our understanding of our Father in heaven. He's going to heal wounds of Father wounds that we've had in our life because the way we view sometimes our Father on earth is how we view God. And God wants to break that mindset because that is not how we should view God. No one will even compare to the goodness of God, even if you had the best Father. But often the fracture from our earthly Father can affect our heavenly Father's view. And John 3.16 is the most famous Scripture of all. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved you. Sometimes we can look at the world and think eight billion people and it depersonalises it. But God loved you 
And He loved you so much that in your brokenness of your humanity and your sinful and willful behaviour to, to actually put Him on the outside, He still chose to die for you. He still chose to send Jesus to you. He didn't have to. There is Scripture in the Old Testament where a couple of times God actually is remorseful and regrets creating humanity because they still just mess it up every time. He's like, how wicked, how crazy can these people be? I almost regret making you. But He doesn't discard us. He doesn't let us go. He doesn't go, you know what, who cares? Let's start again. Actually, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we were great before. We can still continue to go on. We've got the angels that worship. We've got all this in heaven to be glorified, but no. He pursued us in our willful, sinful nature. And even Jesus, Scripture says that before the foundations of the world, He'd already purposed to die for us. He knew we were gonna mess up, yet He still chose to create us and chose to die for us. Are you aware of this? This is God's love and we have as Christians sometimes a disconnected view of God's love. We think it's conditional. We think it's temporary. We think it's circumstantial. We think we have to come ready and clean before God when all the while He's been trying to tell us from the beginning of time, I love you. I'm for you. And today I want us to actually understand God's love for us that He sent His Son. It's the Father's love because when you get this peace right, you'll get this peace right. We don't know how to love one another sometimes because we don't actually understand the love of our Father. We're so fractured and broken that we're trying to get validation from fathers, mothers, leaders, spouses, friends, careers, finances. All the while, the love that we're looking for has been given to us. We've just not received it. And today, I want us to look at the story of the prodigal son because I think this absolutely shows us the picture of the prodigal father. You see, the prodigal means wasteful and extravagant. And while the prodigal son was wasteful and extravagant in squandering everything that he had, the father was seemingly wasteful and extravagant in his love and pursuit of his son. And I want today for us to have ears to hear because I actually believe God's gonna recalibrate our hearts to actually get a glimpse of the Father's love for us because I think this is why sometimes we're striving in our Christian walk, working for God's approval, working for God's uh, affirmation, working for God's pleasure when God says nothing you can do will ever measure up to how much I love you. While you're busy working for God, God's like, uh, I already love you. It was while you were a sinner that I pursued you. God pursued Adam and Eve when they sinned. He didn't discard them. The enemy had them believing that he was in, they were in trouble. But God saying, Adam, Eve, where are you? That's a pursuing nature. That's not a rejecting nature. Where are you? All He wanted to hear from Him is like, here we are, God, we're so sorry. Come, let me cover you. They hid in shame, yet God wanted to cover them. Mercy covers, mercy pursues, love goes after. And this is the God that we serve. And when we have a skewed understanding of the love of God, we will never fully live in the fullness of who we are. We'll always be trying to reach for something when you don't know God's love for you. So let's read this parable in Luke 15, verse 11. It says, Jesus continued. And the reason why He's continuing is because He's talking about 
the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. He's going through about how much He loves the Gentiles, how much He's come after humanity, and that all will be saved because this is the heart of God. No matter how far you feel like you've gone, God says, I am in pursuit of you and I will not stop until you receive me. But He keeps pursuing. And so He continues and says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything there, he was, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Gosh, you know you're in desperate times when you can't even eat pig food. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. This is my favourite part of the story. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered him, Father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders. Yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the most beautiful picture of the Father's love to both His sons. And I believe in the church, there are two types of people. There are those that have deliberately rebelled against God and squandered their life and literally have wound up messing their lives up, consequence after consequence from bad decisions. And yet they come back to God, but there is this feeling of unworthiness, this feeling that says I'm unworthy. Now, just to make things clear, we're all unworthy. Every single one, whether you grew up and you never did a, a thing wrong, which is impossible because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We are all unworthy. There is nobody on this earth that is righteous. There's nobody on this planet except for Jesus when He walked the earth that was perfect. So all of us are unworthy, that's a fact. But when we find Jesus, or He finds us rather, and we respond to Him, when we get saved, when we acknowledge our sin and we respond to Him and we get 
Jesus in our lives, we are now worthy because of what Jesus has done. Yet in my 30 years of ministry, I cannot tell you how many Christians still think they're unworthy. It's actually an epidemic. I'm unworthy for that and I'm unworthy for that. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And if you think you're unworthy, you will live like you're unworthy, but it's actually a lie. So you're partnering with a lie because according to Scripture, you were made holy, you are holy because of what Jesus did for you. Yet we put our salvation on us for some reason, like, well, because I've sinned and because I've done this. We're all unworthy. Just get that in your brain and realise because of Jesus, you've been made worthy. But there's a difference between knowing it and knowing it. Knowing it, knowing it. I've met enough Christians who call themselves believers that know how to recite words, but don't know how to live the revelation in their ma- it's in a man. This is where the, the shift occurs. Because when you've had a revelation of the love of your Father, you can't help but live like you've been saved. Your Father loves you. Your Father loves you, has constantly been in pursuit of you, will always be in pursuit of you. But if you don't get a revelation, He'll keep loving you. But when you don't know how to receive it, you'll keep living like the unworthy young man in this story. So we have this young man who decides, I can do it my way. Let me take what's mine. I think the arrogance here is just so crazy and we've all been there. The arrogance to believe that our life is our own, (laughs) that we're in control of it somehow. Give me my inheritance. I'll do it from here, God. This is my life, my way. Well, let's see how far it's going to get you when you think it's your life, your way. And this is where ignorance and immaturity and whatever you wanna call it, we all think that we can do life our way. We think we know better, but God is the one who created us, not us. And yet this young man, he takes his inheritance and he demands it from his father and says, give me my inheritance. And you never hear an argument from the father. This is a lesson to be learned from him because this is God the Father, this is free will. This is free will that He gives each and every one of us because it would not be a relationship if He did not give us free will to choose. And He didn't wanna keep His son hostage He released his son and said, all right, son, this is yours. I'll divide it up. You take your portion and do with it what you think is what you wanna do. This is what I love about God. Do you realise as Christians, I think we're so judgmental that if God who created humanity gives us the dignity to choose, why are we so bent on making people who are non-believers try and live like a Christian? I will never understand this. I will never understand how we get into arguments with unbelievers about moral issues. I would encourage us as we come into this political season that we would not treat non-believers and put the same expectation that we have conviction of on them because they don't know any better. Our job, is to be Jesus. Our job is to present truth in love. Our job is to bring the conviction of our heart in a way that it makes people want to live like us. But you can't legislate morality. Right? We can't. Only God can change the heart of man. And this is where God gives free will. He says, you choose. I've given you what I believe is the, is, is the road book to life, but you get to choose. And He gave this to this son. You choose, son. And this son went out and he squandered everything and he was left desolate. He was left 
wanting. He was left in lack. He had lived wildly. He was unwise and he squandered everything. And then he finds himself in a far distant land asking to be a hired hand and he gets sent to the pig pen. Now, no Jewish young man or woman should ever have gone near pigs because it was unclean, let alone eat what the pigs are eating. Yet he's now desiring what the pigs are eating. Isn't it amazing in Proverbs 27, 7, it says, One who is full loathes honey from the comb, but to the hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. You see, when we're desperate, we'll take anything. When we don't know who we are, we'll take anything. When we don't know whose we are, we'll take anything. We'll take scum of the earth and think that it's a feast. We'll take the slop of pigs and go, well, at least it's something. But God has so much more for you and you don't understand the Father's heart for you when you are settling for pig slop. God says, I've got a feast at my table for every single one of you, but you just need to do it my way. And yet He comes to His senses. I believe He finally comes to the end of Himself. Oh, I pray that when we come to the end of ourselves, we know it's the beginning with God. You see, so many of us come to the end of ourselves and we wanna end it all. But God says, no, come to the end of yourself so that you can begin with me because you can't do this on your own. You think you're smart, but you're not. I love you, son. I love you, daughter, but I created you and I formed every part of you so I know what is best for you. But get to the end of yourself, yes, but make sure you begin with me because when you begin with me, Everything begins to change. And he came to his senses thinking, what am I doing in this pig pen? When the hired hands of my father's household, and what you have to understand, a hired hand was different to a slave that was living in the household and living on the property. The hired hand would come in and leave at the end of the day and get their wages. But a person who worked for the household lived as an employee. So they get to eat of the food and they get to be in the chambers. On, it's not maybe in the household, but on the property, there's more care. But even the hired hands were getting food that they had to spare. And here is the heir of this family name who's sitting in a pig pen because he chose to do what he thought was right and it's left him desolate. He's come to the end of himself and he's had an epiphany and gone, what have I done? You know, this is the greatest place to be. You see, this is where the enemy will often come in and lie to you saying, you can't go back, you can't go back to your father. But I thank God this story says that he has this moment and says, I've got to go back because I've sinned against heaven and my father. True repentance. See, when we are repentant in our heart, then we can go and confess our sin. The Bible says that what we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, that He is faithful to forgive us. And this is how easy it is, but the enemy keeps us bound by our guilt and our shame. But this son doesn't, because I think the way he was released allowed him to understand he would be received. You see, if God can release you with free will to choose, He's going to receive you if you have free will to choose Him. See, the enemy would have you believe He's not gonna accept you. He's not going to forgive you. He's ashamed of you. He, he doesn't love you. He hates your sin. Yes, He hates sin, but why does He hate sin? Because it keeps you separate from Him. And yet He came and He said, you know what, I'm going back to my Father but I'm unworthy to be His son. But even if I could be a hired hand, I'm gonna go to Him. I love this moment because it says that while He was a long way off, do you know what that says to me? That the Father was waiting for Him. The Father wasn't 
busy doing his own thing, waiting for a knock at the door and being surprised. But while the sun was a long way off, and I know I'm speaking to people today because you feel a long way off. Maybe you've hobbled in here this morning. Maybe you've just been able to get in. Maybe you couldn't even get in, but you're watching online and God's saying, I've been waiting. I'm, I'm here looking to see, even if I can see a glimpse of you. And when He sees Him and He's a long way off, He doesn't stand there like most of us who would be so mad with our kids and we'd be like, let's see what they have to say for themselves. I told you so. I knew it would end this way. How stupid could you be? You've got yourself into this mess. We've all been there. We've treated others like that in judgment. Yet God the Father, He's a long way off and He sees, and what does He do? He runs towards, He runs towards, swift in mercy, not in delay, not waiting for you to come to me. I'm the Father, I've done nothing wrong. You better show yourself worthy to me. No, 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 He runs. He runs to His Son and then He throws His arms around Him. What does that say? I love you. He would have been filthy. He would have stunk. He would have been revolting. Who knows the last time he bathed? Who knows what had happened, what he was even wearing? I don't know, but all I know is a father doesn't care when their son or daughter comes home. It should be a wrapping of your arms around. And if that does not move you, to know that the loving arms of the Father is waiting for you. And when you're just ready to come back, He's running towards you. And then when I see the kiss that He gave Him, it says, I don't ever wanna stop being intimate. There is no severing. There's no disconnection. You don't now have to earn your way back. You don't have to pay penance. I don't know how you were brought up. Maybe God was a judgmental God on a big throne that wanted to punish you every time you, you fell short of something. But my loving God says, no, 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 no. I'm here to pursue you. I'm here to run after you. I'm here to wrap my arms around you. I'm here to cover you. But also I wanna kiss you. Why? Because I wanna be intimate with you because the whole goal has been intimacy. The whole goal has been to know you and dwell with you and be with you. That's my whole goal for you and I. I don't want that broken anymore. And so He kisses Him. And I just love the Father's love towards the Son that whether He's done wrong, He doesn't really go into the details because His eyes were full of compassion. And when you're moved by compassion, you act. His legs caused Him to run swiftly to show mercy. And then mercy covers and then those arms that wrapped around Him, full love. And then a kiss to seal that intimacy. It hadn't been lost on his part. And yet the son then confesses with his mouth and says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. See what he had had the revelation of in the pig pit. He now comes and confesses to his father. And do you know what I love about this moment? In the midst of when he's confessing and he's about to say, I wanna be a hired hand. The father interrupts him. He says, quick, bring the robes, bring the ring, bring the shoes. What's he saying? I'm not gonna even let you determine that you're unworthy to me because I know who you are because you're bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And so now here is a robe of righteousness. What is that? That's the garment of salvation. I'm gonna cover these filthy rags that you're wearing and I'm gonna put you in your rightful place with me in my kingdom. I'm gonna give you a ring that signifies power of attorney. Everything that I have is yours. 
Wealthy young men wore signet rings and it was a representation of ownership and inheritance. And it was visible to everybody around them. And let me get you these shoes, these shoes where slaves did not wear shoes, but sons did. But also these feet readied with the Gospel of peace that that which you've received, now you're gonna walk, son, in who you are according to my name because you have always been my son. It's never changed in my eyes. While you have squandered, while you have gone away, while you've chosen your way, it doesn't change your position in my eyes. And so therefore, here comes the robe, here comes the ring, here comes the shoes, and here comes a feast where most people, maybe on the outer, He comes and gives them a seat at His table. And that's what God does. That's the love of God. He didn't just clothe Him at that moment. He adorned Him. He didn't just replace filthy rags with a robe. He made him a royal priesthood. He set him apart. You're mine. You belong to me. Therefore, how you look matters because on the inside of who you are, you're my son. He didn't just clothe us with righteousness, church, when He saved us, He adorned us. We are heirs with Christ. But we've got such a dysfunctional view of our Father that we don't live like royalty. I honestly can't tell you how many people I've heard these exact words, I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy to receive God. I see how people act. I see what comes out of people's mouths. Oh, I'm not worthy to receive that. How could I ever? I've do, you don't know me, Alex. Oh my gosh, who cares about your past? Whether you've done the worst or whether you've not done anything, we're all on the equal playing field of being unworthy. And so God says, now because of what Jesus has done, I make you royal. I make you righteous and I'm clothing you. You see, this is where the extravagance of God is so unbelievable that it blows my mind. It blows my mind that God would love such a wretched sinner like us and then go, you know what? Forget the past. This is who you are. You see, when you receive that understanding as revelation, you can't live like a pauper anymore. You don't live like like you want a taste of the junk of the world. You don't go after the filthy things of the world because they're not tempting to you because they're pig slop. When you get a seat at the Father's table, why would you go for pig slop? Sex, drugs, alcohol, pornography, adulterous affairs. Whatever you think's going to satisfy you, church, it will leave you empty because nothing measures to the love of God. Nothing measures to being a son and a daughter of the King, nothing. And while we're looking out here for all the things that we think fill us, God says, do you know who you are? Do you realise that I am your loving Father and nothing can separate you from my love? Nothing. And nothing shocks God. The enemy is such a filthy liar. He just wants you dragged down to his level. When you partner with him and agree with him, you become like him. When you say, I'm sorry, that is not who my father is, but you've got to know who your father is. You realise right from the beginning, we've watched God the Father be in covenant with His children and constantly defy natural circumstances by saying, I'm still gonna love you. I will not break covenant with you. Whether you break it, I'll go in your place for it. This whole book is a love story of pursuit. It's a pursuing of your heart. Yet we live with such a finite understanding because maybe you had a skewed relationship with your earthly father. I'm just gonna say it here and right now. 
Everyone is broken. Your story is your story and I'm not making light of it. But God is a great Father who can redeem it. And this story says that my Father loves me and that He's in pursuit of me and that He wants to make me whole. And so He comes and He brings a party because you know what? When somebody is saved, it says in Luke 15, 10, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Do you realise all of heaven rejoices when one sinner, see this whole, these these parables are talking about salvation. This is how much God loves us. He's like, my whole mission is to send Jesus so that He can destroy the work of the enemy and restore you back to your original design. Restore you to sonship. Restore you to kingship. Restore you, you know, he, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, which means we're called to be royalty, kings and lords. But most of us are walking around like unworthy paupers sitting in a pig pen. And God says, come, let me bestow upon you a feast because you've come back home. And today I feel like God's wanting to restore two types of people in this house. One, where you've been saved or maybe you've literally gone away from the Lord and you feel like you're so far gone, you can never get back. Well, I'm here to tell you today, God is pursuing you. In fact, this message, I wrestled over it all week. You asked Pastor Henry and I didn't know what, whether I should bring this, but now I know more than anything that I need to because this is an area of dysfunction in the global church because if we truly knew who our Father was, we would walk with different posture. And so I want to make sure that everyone here that still has ever said in their mind, in their heart, I'm unworthy to receive or I'm not, you know, my past is still haunting me or I'm still having to try and forgive myself. This is this message for you, but this message is also for the religious brother or sister that's in the house. Because meanwhile, back at the ranch, we have a religious brother. (laughs) And... What Jesus is really talking to here is the Pharisees that can't accept the fact that Gentiles are gonna be brought into the house of God. Who are we to choose? Who are we to decide who comes back to the Lord when we're just as filthy? And yet as Christians, we can become accidental Pharisees. We could become those Pharisees that look down upon our brothers and sisters who are even in the church. And yet this brother refuses to go into the house after his brother had been lost and now is found. You might look at this and go, whoa, that is, I would never do that. But you know what? I've actually seen this in real time. I've watched people go, oh, I don't trust them, not having them back. And this is where I just had a gentleman literally in the previous service come with tears running down his face, being in church, being excommunicated, the way he was treated so harshly. He says, I haven't been able to worship God in 15 years, but today the Spirit of God penetrated my heart and the Father called me back. Why? Because sometimes we let people Be like the pharisaical brother, keep us out of the house. And he's like, I'm not going in. He's been squandering. He even exaggerates the story. He doesn't know if he's been with prostitutes. Was he there? Or maybe that's what he would have done if he had been squandering. It's amazing that we'll often judge others with what's really deep inside of our heart. been squandering and while he's been squandering, I've been slaving. Oh, we've got to be careful with these kinds of words because a true son doesn't slave. A true son doesn't work for the father. The true son has an inheritance. The true son is, true son is an owner. He doesn't slave. Why was he in the field in the first place? 
Because you know what I've found? Pharisaical Christians have a martyr mentality. I'm doing so much for God. I'm doing so much over here. I am so much more holier than thou. I am so great because you know what? I tithe every week and I serve at my church and I know the Scriptures. And yet when a sinner who doesn't look like them or perhaps is... It offends their, their whatever it is. If you can't receive somebody, then you've got a religious spirit and a pharisaical spirit living inside of you. And so he says, I'm not coming in. That's what the Pharisees did. Don't come near me, you're unclean. Don't come near me, leopard. Don't come near, don't come near me, adulterer. Don't come near. I cannot be associated with you, Samaritan woman. I cannot be seen with you. You see, we actually do this in our Christianity. We might not do it with sinners, but we'll do it with fellow believers. And this is where we have an orphaned spirit. You see, you can be living in a household and still be orphaned because it's your posture of understanding who your Father is. This orphan spirit finds its expression in many ways. You see, an orphan spirit struggles with feelings of inadequacy, even though they're completely provided for. An orphan spirit is compelled to strive to get approval. An orphan spirit continually compares themselves with others. Why did He get that? Why did they get that opportunity? An orphan spirit always tries to do something that gives them a sense of validation. Look at me, I've been slaving. I've been serving. And we can get like this in church. You see, when I was young, I had lived a little bit in the world and a little bit at church. I'd always gone to church because in my rule in my household is that you, if you live in my parents' house, you have to be at church every Sunday morning and Sunday night, that's just the rule. And if you don't like it, go find lodging somewhere else on your own terms. And so while I was sometimes not living 100% for God, I always loved God, but I was living in this tension of like, do I really believe? And I think I'm just gonna try a few things myself. And so I remember really coming back to Jesus just on the cusp of my 21st birthday. And I had been away kind of like toying with God for about, since I was 18 to to 20. So about that two and a half years of just being at church, but not really being present. But when I gave my life to Jesus afresh, because I got saved when I was 11, but I really became a disciple. I believe there's a difference because I gave my whole heart to God and therefore I yielded everything to God. I came back into the fold and my leaders who had always seen a call of God on my life received me and said, finally, she's come to her senses. She's come to the end of herself at the beginning with God. And immediately I I, I found myself serving in my youth ministry and being promoted. And then a, a year after that, I got put on staff as the new Christians believer, a pastor. And I had several friends of mine who had stayed faithful, be really angry that I was now in this position. And this was their gossip about me. I've been slaving here. I've been serving here. I've been faithfully building this house with my pastors and they choose Alex for the job. See, we do this in church. But God is the one who brings promotion because God looks at the heart. God isn't looking for a perfect score of a record of life. He's looking for a heart that is so contrite that says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. And when he sees that, he's like, oh, I can trust you. But we can sometimes be the religious brother that says, well, because I have done, then I am deserving of. God doesn't work like that. And we can judge our brother and our sister and go, well, why did they get promoted? And I've been slaving my guts out in this church and I've got a dream to do this. And I've got, well, maybe you're not ready yet because your heart is still about you. Because that's what this religious brother was. It was all about him. And yet what I love about the father, again, he's not rebuking this son. 
he just turns to him and he says, but you've been with me the whole time. You don't have the baggage that your brother has. You're not gonna have to go through in a healing of traumatic consequences to your actions. You have a testimony that you've stayed faithful. But to also say that he's never disobeyed and never done anything wrong, that's a pride spirit. We can't ever say that because trust me, guys, I'm repenting on the daily for my attitude or, you know, for my responses because none of us are perfect. And yet the Father says, I've been here with you the whole time. You've had everything. If you had asked for a party, I would have given it to you. We had access to it. But you chose to live in a martyr mindset that says, I'm slaving for you and I'm working. And that's what the Pharisees did. They worked for God's approval, not from God's approval. And when we work for God's approval, it's a dangerous place because there's always a measure of what we think we're owed. If the band could come. He doesn't understand his position as son. And he judges his brother. The Bible is clear that we're all made righteous in Christ. Romans 8.15 says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, And by Him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. It's intimate. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. See, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you, He loved you, that He would give of Himself, that He would give that was most precious, holy, blameless, spotless, perfect for wretched sinners like us that He would send blameless, righteous, perfect Jesus, who's done nothing wrong, who's never sinned, to say, you know what? I'll take your sin. I'll stand in your place. I'll be the murderer. I'll be the adulterer. I'll be the thief. I'll be the liar. I'll be the squanderer. I'll be you so that you don't have to be banished separate from me forever. If we do not understand God's love from this act and we're treating that as familiar, we need to get saved again. Because I don't forget I live every day grateful as I was even reading over my notes. I'm weeping saying, God, I don't deserve this. But oh, how grateful I am to have received it. Therefore, the best gift I can give back to you is to live like a daughter of the King. To live like I'm righteous because You made me righteous to believe in You and do not doubt because You are a God of Your Word. To stand faithful, to never be ashamed of the Gospel, that I will preach it until the day I die because of what You've done for me. You see, I live from a place of gratitude. I live from an overflow of love. I know who I am because I am loved by a God who sent Jesus in my place and therefore I stand clean, I stand healed, I stand forgiven. 
I stand righteous, holy, blameless in His sight. What a gift. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Oh, I feel the anointing of God so strong in this place that He is drawing sons and daughters before you. Before Him. Right now, there are two types of people that need to stand and respond. There are those of you that have literally, perhaps purposely done stuff in your past and you've become a Christian and you just can't forgive yourself. You still feel unworthy. There's a disconnect. Some of you have got such deep father wounds that you've put God in the same place. And so you look at God as someone who's abandoned you. God never abandoned you. People have, but God hasn't. Because God's always been there. In some shape or form, He has been there. He promises to never leave you or forsake you. But yet we deem Him forsakeable because we want God on our terms. But God never leaves us or forsakes us. And some of you, you're living so poorly because of your posture and understanding of Father. God wants to make that right today. He wants you to let go of your past, let go of the guilt and shame, the fear, the disconnect where you constantly feel like you just, it just how could I ever be your full son? Could I ever be your full daughter? The answer is yes, but God wants to recalibrate that today by His Spirit and the other person is the brother, the other brother that you've been in a religious relationship. I don't even know if, call it, if we can call it a relationship, but you've been in a religious rut where you work for God because again, you haven't understood that the Father loves you and He wants you to, He's calling you to walk with Him, not work for Him. He's calling you to dwell with Him, get to know Him, be intimate with Him, that all the stuff that we do for God is, is actually the overflow of our relationship with Him. And you've looked at other people and you've compared yourself and there's that orphan spirit that always feels like you're missing out or He favours somebody else over you or somebody else has got the better treatment and you've got the lesser treatment. There is a fractured understanding of a good Father in your life. And there's no shame in this. And I actually believe that when we respond to Him, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, church, our duty is to respond because it's in our response that humility says, that's me. You see, the, the, the prodigal son had to humble himself it would have taken a lot for him to go back to his father. He didn't know how he was gonna be received. But it's the humility of our heart that says, God, I'm wrong in this area. Do you know what I've learned, church? I'm 51 years of age. I've learned that whenever I feel the slightest conviction about something, and I'm a senior pastor of a church, means nothing when I'm in the throne room of God. I'm a daughter. I'm a little girl before Him. And the minute the Holy Spirit convicts me of something, I'm the first to respond because it doesn't lessen you. In fact, God says, I resist the proud. And I'm speaking to some proud Christians in this room and online. He actually resists that, but He gives grace to the humble. Why? Because of Jesus Himself, who was God, humbled Himself to the point of death. See, what you're doing today by responding is saying, God, I fall short. Whether I've been walking with You, but there's a fracture. Whether I've just still lived in the past and I can't get free of that. I believe God wants to break some things over your mind, your soul and your heart. And I want you to stand to your feet right now if that's you. And I know there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you because I feel the Spirit of God so strong. The slightest disconnect. 
whenever you've spoken just those little words even in yourself of could I or would I or why or all of those things represent a heart that says, I don't know if I'm fully, fully, fully loved by an ever loving Father. Come on, there's more of you. (laughs) I know it. Don't resist, don't resist, don't resist. Don't be stubborn. (laughs) Don't be proud. Don't be proud, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, God's gonna do something right now. I just see it taking place, taking shape, taking root right now. Just raise your hands, close your eyes. There's a sweet, sweet Spirit of God. Sweet Spirit of God, raise your hands. Some of you got your hands in your pocket. Yield, raise your hands. Don't just stand there. Posture, see what your hands do. They express what your heart's feeling. I surrender, I yield, I give up ownership. Right now, Father, you see hearts surrendered. Minds. I declare right now in the Name of Jesus, in the Name of Jesus, breakthrough. Recalibrate hearts and minds to receive Sonship, to receive the posture that You are their Father and that everything that is in the past is in the past. Your transgressions have been cleansed. They've been made to go from the East to the West. There is nothing that can ever be brought back to you. And so I declare right now that whatever broken view of the Father that we have, God, let it be made right. Let them right now receive the love of a Father in waves over them by Your Spirit. Right now, let them feel the love that You so loved them. God, let them have revelation, whatever's been in the blockage of their mind and their heart, let that be broken in the Name of Jesus.